today I've got actually a really great uh, friend of mine, Bindi Bennett. Um, Bindi will tell you more about herself in a minute, but hi, Bindi. Hey, how are you going? <laughs> good, good. Nice to see you. Lovely to see you as well. Thank you. So, Bindi, tell us a little bit about yourself. Who are you? Where you're from? Well, Yama Nindeu, Bindi Naya, Gimilaroi Naya, Gaya Naya, Nale Tuandu, Jinabara. My name is Bindi. I'm a Gimilaroi woman from northern New South Wales. My grandmother comes from Narrabri, Umori area, um, and I'm just acknowledging in language that I'm currently on Jinabara country, um, where I work, play, and um, sort of live. Um, and for people who, the other, who am I? Sorry. <laughs> Right. For people Gina, who don't know where Ginnabar is, where is it? It's sort of up on the um, in Queensland um, in the Glasshouse Mountains region, um, just just before Gubby Gubby Cabby Cabby uh, countries and um, before Jugara country. So just sort of in that middle area there. It's a beautiful area to be in. Mm, beautiful. So tell us a little bit, what do you do now? What is your role right this minute? Uh, my job at the moment is a professorial research fellow with the National Centre for Reconciliation, Truth and Justice. And what does that mean? <laughs> well, for me, um, my research is actually all about um, social justice and transformational change. So everything I'm doing, I'm doing to look at improving well-being for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So all of my research and grants and things that I do, and we can talk a bit more about it later if you like, is... is um, based around that so that's what i do day to day at the moment and i really enjoy it yeah so i asked you a question where did you grow up um so i grew up mostly in canberra um on none all countries um but i had an interesting um as i do as most people do we have interesting lived experiences i was not um very well as a young person so i was in and out of hospital quite a lot uh, i think my longest stint in hospital was around nine months at a time so I missed significant chunks of school I, I think I remember all up maybe three or four weeks at a time if, in a year if I was lucky yeah uh, I'd probably have to be pretty lucky so I didn't really go to school um, until year seven and at that stage I had I was put in all they had really nasty names for them back then they actually called them veggie math is what they were called in veggie English. So you kind of had that label of being not very smart. And I was put into all those classes and I had to, from year seven up, sort of work my way up. But I think um, the label stuck and I think for a very long time I didn't think I was very smart. And I did get into year 11 and 12 but and I did get an Aboriginal scholarship to go to a university and I went to ANU and I... Um, I was getting credits, but I thought I was failing. In my mind, I just couldn't put it together that I was going okay. So I kind of crashed and burned and went out into the field and worked. And it was there that I was really um, taken care of by a very significant elder who basically um, said to me, oh, what are you doing next year? And I said, I don't know, probably not much, just going to keep working. And um, then this letter arrived and I was signed up to do social work. Um, <laughs> and I sort of thought, rang them and said, oh, what's this? And they said, oh, I think you'll be a really good fit. And I thought, yeah, okay, I'll give it a go. So I did uh, social work at ACU and literally they went around the circle. I'm not sure social workers in the room, they'll all understand why you're here doing social work. And everyone's saying, oh, I'm here to save the world. And I literally said I'm here because I, my uncle signed me up. <laughs> <laughs> not really sure. Wasn't really sure what social work was how I was going to fit in, but even then I did. I had a passion for change and social justice and equity and assisting and um, advocating with and for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So it was, it was definitely a fit. So what moved you into the research area? Um, well, so for 20 years I was, a, I was actually a practitioner in mental health mainly and I, I saw um, a lot of intergenerational trauma and all of the... I guess, the things that we talk about in the deficit. And I could see that um, practice may change, but I kind of wanted to make more change. So I, I went in, I don't want one at a time, I want 10 or 20 or 30 at a time. So I went into academia, into tutoring, thinking here I have 20 to 30 bodies in front of me that I can change at a time. Um, and 
although I enjoy that a lot, I then sort of thought, you know where I can make even more change is in research and policy. That's the the next place where I could possibly change whole communities at a time or whole areas at a time. So that's really what pushed me into it. But the second reason was um, at the time when I when I was talking to, again, the same elder <laughs> about whether or not to do a PhD, I had a young person who had significant um, challenges in life and I just realised I couldn't do the same work. People who are in social work probably understand there's quite a lot of empathy and patience and energy that you put into practice. And I needed something where nobody's life was at risk, not really. And yeah. and if and if I didn't write a paper, if I didn't get that grant in, it was disappointing, but it could hold. And and that was really and has been the joy of um, academia is that I can also be a parent a really active, supportive, advocating parent, which I have needed to be, and hold those two spaces energetically. Um, some days I can put more energy into work and some days I can put more energy into my home life and, and what's going on there. And so that's it's not always balanced, but it's more balanced than, than I could have if I'd stayed in the field. Yeah. So... What, what topic did you do for your PhD and why did you choose that topic? For my PhD, I did how um, do light-skinned Aboriginal people find their identity if they have been removed or have not been able to have their identity. And it's um, two reasons I did that. The first one was I was incredibly gifted um, growing up. A lot of people put a lot of energy into me, into teaching me languages and weaving and dancing and songs and creating a real Aboriginal community for me, um, even though I have light skin. and But my concern was, um, as I was parenting my child, I was seeing a lot of families that w weren't having those gifts. And my concern was, what's going to happen for our next generation? What's going to happen for the generation after that? How do we... Uh, if we accept that culture is life and culture is well-being, which I believe it is, how do we create that for the next generation? So that was kind of the question is, can you actually, how do you start that journey? How do you create an Aboriginal community if you didn't even know you had one? And and how does that all go? And um, so that's really been the start of a lot of my research questioning is that understanding of how do we create um, spaces that can um, enhance well-being and identity, which are, which is pretty much the pivotal of everything. Yeah, I, I I work with a lot of young Aboriginal men and and women who kind of they, they feel a bit weird when people say that they've they've lost culture because some of them said they never had culture to start off with. You know, their yes. their parent their parents identify as being Aboriginal may not be able to even acknowledge which language group they come from and they go it's pretty weird when people say you've lost culture because they go we, we we've never had it but we want to know it we want to learn it because it's been lost in our family but it's not lost we haven't lost it because we never had it yeah i had a couple of things on that this significant elder once said to me it's not lost, it's just sleeping. It's sleeping in the country and it's up to us to breathe life back into the, into it so that we can create it. It can change a little bit from what it was before to suit how we are now because culture is ever-changing. And that really hit hard for me that um, that these people that um, have lost it, they don't, they, there's no way they've lost it. It absolutely is in them. It is all around them. It's just how do they breathe life into it. And the second thing that was really important about that that conversation that we're having is that um, there there's so many people who um, there's a lot of violence around coming out as Aboriginal as a you know people call it things like Johnny Come Lately or these sort of things, but it's actually uh, colonisation that caused that problem, not that person and not that family. Colonisation deliberately tried to commit genocide on those on us as Aboriginal people. We only got this wicked problem because of that. So if we can be Aboriginal about it and kind about it, that's I had an uncle 
who um he was removed he was stolen generation and they they never told him where he came from they lied to him about where he came from so he could never even find his country in his lifetime but he lived being aboriginal aboriginal values aboriginal worldviews aboriginal everything he could he was he embodied aboriginality so what was he meant to be and these were the lessons around me that i was thinking how do we how do we um, stop treating it like it's a pie and there's only so many pieces of it and only so many people deserve it and should have it? Why are we fighting over it? Why don't we create it and for everyone that is and be more generous with it um, so that it passes to the next generation well? So, yeah, yeah I have some social work values around it, hey? <laughs> um, have, you seen, have you seen the profession of social work change in the last 20 years or so have i seen it or yeah. how have i seen it? both not really. how, or have you seen it change not really no i would have to say i think that it's become more tried to become more visible but i still believe it's quite performative yeah. um i don't know that there's been any deep changes i do and have seen curriculum content but it frustrates me because we as social work have not decided what content, how, um, how it's evaluated, how it's monitored, how we know it's making change. It's been very haphazard. Um, so there's a lot of tokenistic talk, but I haven't necessarily seen people commit to it. I, I see a lot of people saying, oh, someone should do something about that. And and yet, here we are. So um, have I seen that some more things? Yes, but have we really? I think one of the big problems we have is the diversity of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And so non-Indigenous people sometimes will pick the nice one Aboriginal person that they get on with versus making sure that the table is filled with diversity and robust deep, critically reflexive conversations. You don't have to like people, but you still actually have to listen and hear and give them some privilege and power. So I haven't seen that move. I've seen, does that make sense? That's very feisty, isn't it? But it's true. It's true. It's true. Definitely true. <laughs> and I, I, I worry about it because I think there's a way that's accepted, a very non-Indigenous way of being that's accepted. And if you are demanding, as I do, transformational change. You get labelled troublesome, angry, difficult, hard to play in the sandpit with, etc. And it's and perhaps you are, but actually it's also that you demand that it affect them. You demand action from it. And that's where they're still not comfortable. They're very comfortable saying the acknowledgement. They're very comfortable um, performing it, but they're not actually comfortable taking the next step yet that I've seen. Yeah, I agree with you. I think sometimes when I when I do training, I say to people, like, what does cultural safety mean to you as a non-Indigenous person? And they kind of struggle. So I'm going, well, how can you ensure that your Aboriginal clients feel culturally safe when you can't even define it for yourself? I think even taking it a step back, what is your culture? Yes. What is your culture? And then so many non-Indigenous people say to me, I don't have a culture. And I say, of course you do. Even the way we serve up apple pie for dessert is a culture. The way we dress is a culture. We choose cultures. We choose ways to be and know and do what's yours. And that's where the work starts. A lot of people are very uncomfortable with it because they say, but I don't want to be um, attached to Britain and, and the colony and it's done some really awful things. Well, yes, not everybody in Aboriginal communities are necessarily been 100% good all the time either. There's good, bad moments in all history in all cultures but it's it's still that's you <laughs> that's still you so how are you going to be the best in that so this is the conversation i start with is how can you be culturally responsive if you don't know what your own culture is you can't be responsive to me then yeah i know mine yeah <laughs> so social workers struggle with that yeah I think I actually think most health professionals struggle with that when you're looking mm -hmm. across the whole field. And I, and I think that, mm -hmm. yes, we are starting to see more curriculum changes, but the thing that I don't, 
I think this is the same things being taught all the time, and that's around the social determinants and the and parts of history. But people not walking away with acting any practical skills about how to work with Aboriginal people. We've got an Aboriginal person in front of you. What am I supposed to do? How do I make them feel culturally safe? How do I make them inclusive? How do I? And I don't think people are learning the practicalities of engaging with Aboriginal people. If that I makes. think I think that this it's incredibly problematic as a as a um, educator because um, you have to teach say a hundred people, but you have to have a scaffold and you have to have a, a mark. And if you have to start, which we do each year, at the assumption that everyone is zero, you cannot get to 100 in four years. It is impossible. And I think what is missing in the field still is more training from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and not just the hand-picked people, all the diversities of peoples and intersectionalities of peoples because we definitely don't have some voices out there still. And and some um, ongoing learning and training. Um, so piece of research that I am creating at the moment is a culturally responsive 2D, 3D simulation package, which will be part of every allied health practicum um, in Australia when it's created. It will be co-designed with um, remote and rural Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander communities. Um, so this will be um, taken off practicum hours, which in some ways alleviates a tiny bit of poverty for people because practicums are such a poverty um, experience for most people. And the idea is that there are not enough Aboriginal placements and we're, we're really exhausting the community, sending out all of these students, but we still have hundreds that never meet an Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander person in their degree. So the idea of this this uh, simulation is that everyone will have an experience. Is it the experience? Of course not. There'll be hundreds that follow it, but it's a start. Mm. Um, and we can't ever say anymore, I never met, or I only had that one week guest lecture, which is nothing. And many times when I go into the room, they're the I'm the first Aboriginal person they've met and they have me for 12 weeks and that's lovely, but they never see me again in the whole degree. Yeah. So it's sort of breaking down some of those pockets and tokenism and really in uh, in my mind weaving, knowing, doing and being an Aboriginal people in from day one to day finish, but then not thinking that, oh, well, now I've got it all, I'll be fantastic. It's a lifelong learning process um, that you're going to need to be doing forever and unless it's in people's PPRs that they have to do it as part of being part of the ASW or being part of whatever profession or being part of this organisation, then we're not going to have real change because people will not engage unless it affects them. And yeah. privilege means it doesn't affect them. So we have to actually remove their privilege and kind of enforce it to, to affect them, to then make them change and to to do it. If that, and then have real bars. You know, you can't work at this organisation unless you you score 51 on the cultural responsiveness tools that we have. And you can show here is a validated score that you're actually making improvements. The next year we'll expect you to get 61. I mean, you'll never get 100, but we will expect you to stay over 51. Yeah. And we don't have any of this. We don't have anybody that, that demands it, oversees it, yeah. evaluates it, measures it. So how do we know we're doing anything at all? Yeah. So maybe I'm wrong, and I'm really happy to have those conversations with people about better ideas and how to do things, but at least we could start somewhere with actually saying, this has all been lovely chit-chat, but where's the action? Yeah. But I think we've had so much chit-chat and committees and subcommittees and r discussions and then, oh, but I don't want to do this because it might offend and I don't do it anything at all. Mm. And we're still in the same spot that we were twenty years ago, even though we progressed. Yeah. A bit. I get like so I get very, very allergic to and frustrated with. I I'm scared to do harm, therefore I do nothing because Aboriginal people have had to be scared of non-Indigenous people forever. There's not one day that we're not concerned when we go into a big group of non-Indigenous people about microaggressions. Um, violence, lateral violence, it's, it's, it's our life. Again, we have to engage 
we have to advocate because it affects us and therefore our people, our children, our future. So um, this is just another way to wield privilege, really. There's more than enough out there to start with. Um, there's the tools you can start, there's um, reading you can start, there's there's people to engage with, there's your podcast. There's, it's literally at their fingertips. It is, again, that conversation of it, um, not, not if you'll make a sta- mistake, because you will. Of course you will, because you're human, which is lovely about you, I like humans, but how you recover. It's, they're always talking to me about my resiliency and I'd like to turn it on to them now. I'm actually quite resilient and I'm the vulnerable population. Well, actually, I'm not vulnerable. I think you're actually quite fragile and vulnerable and resilient and we need to build you up. Aboriginal people have been doing this work for years and it's now time for our non-Indigenous allies to actually come and meet us where we are because we keep going back for them and trying to convince them to come with us. Don't we? It's yeah. endless. It's it's exhausting. We we I call it the bus ride. I'm constantly at bus stop fifteen, having to go back to bus stop one and pick someone up and then go around again. Um, and so that's the conversation I think social work needs to have is okay. How do we, as allies, do that and start that and make sure that we don't just have a committee? I love the idea of a voice. But we've we've been told very clearly that's a no. So we must now not ask anymore. We must actually demand. Yeah. Yeah. Question, what, what makes a good ally? Um, I believe that an ally needs to have the plan for when they make mistakes. So they do need that resiliency plan, which means they have to be quite culturally courageous. And I've spoken about that in my writing before um and then also they have to that's a big word have to but i do believe they have to have some humility it um it takes a lot to be able to say i don't know i need help it's um especially in a non-indigenous world when perfection is one of the colonized ideas um and a good ally really needs to know that they are learning and on a, a learning, they're always going to be learning. They're never going to know everything. And a good ally needs to understand when to cede the space, when to walk beside an Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander person, push them to the front, um, to say to someone, you know, AJ be great for that, not me, actually. Make sure we have voice in meetings. Make sure we protect them when racism comes. Take the bullets for us. So those are some of our good good allies. But you don't need to be a great ally. You just need to be a fairly average ally consistently. Yeah. <laughs> so you've got to wake up tomorrow after you've had a fail and something's gone terribly wrong and I will maybe have a couple of days off with, you know, a bit of chocolate and a cry, fine. But then after a couple of days, you've got to get back into it. It's the consistency of allyship because allies, of course, can walk away because it's not their lives and it doesn't affect them. So it is giving away the privilege and choosing to be with us that makes a uh, – I, I will keep my eye on that kind of person. I know that they've got a really good value set and they're going to be really helpful for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Yeah. Do you have any role models yourself, Aboriginal role models yourself? Oh, I've had hundreds. <laughs> every single uh, every single Aboriginal person in my life has assisted me in some way at some time and that's a bit Aboriginal. I also say that um, my mum was a bit of my hero although she was non-Indigenous because she ceded the space and yeah. she knew how to um, prioritise our Aboriginality and knew how important it was. Um, but, I mean, I I have been really, um, again, really gifted to have been even in the room with some very amazing Aboriginal peoples and I, I think that I'm constantly looking Aboriginal people often lead from behind and quietly as well, so it's constantly looking to the community to see that as well. I've, um, so, yes, I would say yes, I have had that. Um, I've also had many losses in the last couple of years and it's really um, highlighted to me the importance of um, bringing up our younger Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples um, and, and making sure they get chances at leadership. So I'd like to share leadership around. <laughs> I see it differently to some of the structures that are 
here at the moment where one person's leading and there's so many of us that are su- supposed followers, I would rather see a group communal leadership model yeah. um, myself. The terms that get thrown around a lot of things like, you know, reconciliation, what, what does reconciliation mean to you? Yes, well, you see, because I actually work at a centre where it's a big word there, um, and um, it's a difficult word for me because reconciliation indicates that there has been some ciliation, right, that we've actually reconciled and that there's been an apology and that and that none of that has happened in Australia. So for me, reconciliation is actually going back a couple of steps to the truth-telling and to um, looking for those social justice opportunities and those equity um, opportunities and to um, elbow ourselves into some of those spaces to even be at the table if we even want to want that table. Reconciliation is, to me, making a brand new table as well, getting... Um, different ways of knowing, doing and being and putting them up into that third space, Barbara's third space and creating something that hasn't been created before. It's certainly to me addressing the colony and, you know, the the myths of the colony and the continued violences of the colony. So uh, for me, it's a very um, large idea, ideas in some ways to eventually possibly get to that big word, reconciliation. We're certainly not there now. No. Um, question, have you ever experienced racism in your work? Yes. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that was the answer. <laughs> yes, <laughs> of course. <laughs> give us a scenario and, and how, did you, how did you manage that? Um, when I was younger... There's always, as a lighter-skinned Aboriginal, the racism of colour and the racism of understanding um, uh, uh, real Aboriginal people versus non-real Aboriginal people and really trying to get down to that myth. But um, racism comes now in many different kinds of forms in when non-Indigenous people wield their privilege without knowing that they're wielding their privilege, when they set up systems that we don't fit into, when they set up set up forms that we can't fill out because we don't, we don't know how we would fit into that way of thinking, when they set up ethics in ways that are supposed to protect us but, in fact, make more hurdles for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to actually get real change, um, when they don't understand words like co-design, um, sovereignty, um, data sovereignty, self-determination, when um, they say things to you. Well, my favourite lately has been, what do, what do Aboriginal people do for Christmas? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've been asked that and I'm sitting on social media posts at the moment, the same <laughs> question. Um, pardon? <laughs> what do you mean? It's those tiny little microaggressions that add up to big, bigger moments of racism but it's um I was at a um I was in a I won't really give too much because I'll, I'll give away where I was but I was in a big meeting with a lot of people there was about forty two people in the room and all I could hear was people talking about academia I I me me I and even that I said I'm sorry I can't be an I because we're a we you know I'm I'm always representing Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities people's families my own family and someone said to me well that's not academia. And I thought, wow, it's a moment of complete misunderstanding. Was it racism? Maybe not, but it's that tiny misunderstanding to microaggression to racism. Um, it's constantly in academia because academia, I sort of think, is one of those, la- well, maybe not, last frontiers of the ivory tower, and but it's such a neoliberalist, colonist, capitalist um, set up already. It's set up to be, you know, um, not for the well, for money, really, set up for, for wealth and not really necessarily for learning and change anymore. I, I mean, that's a fairly um, feisty thing to say, but again, I think a lot of people would agree. So you see it a lot in the academy. Um, someone came up recently and asked me, Are Aboriginal people still all alive? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know you were still here. So it's even that conversation. Um, 
I see a lot of damage comes to from people from other countries who were, are not being told. Of, they don't, of course, they have not really thought about us when they're in other countries. Why would they? I don't think that's fair. Aboriginal that's, studies doesn't normally appear in their curriculum. Yeah, that, that, that's fair. You know, you, you can understand that. But then once they come to Australia, there's no plan at universities to teach them. They don't have to do – they do the one-hour course and then that's it. Yeah. Um, so as I, I was in a meeting recently. I was weaving sometimes weave at meetings I also colour in I'm that person um <laughs> Aboriginal colouring and stuff and someone came up to me and said I didn't even know this was a th can you tell me about this I didn't even ever know this and then they said to me I have so much to learn don't I I need to do my own work and I thought brilliant yes but nobody actually really says to you you have to when you come to Australia do this enormous amount of working so that's a long conversation. Yes, we see it. Sometimes it's subtle. Sometimes it's not subtle. Sometimes it's microaggressions. Um, I often get comments about the way I look, the way I talk. Um, someone recently told me I didn't speak well enough. I had to go and get some lessons on how to speak a little bit better. And I thought, well, um, I have improved quite a lot, but it sort of feels a little bit like this assimilation model again. You've got to be this certain certain way of talking, dressing, looking, being to be seen as a leader um, and to be seen as an okay Aboriginal person. Um, but I, th I think someone I admire deeply is Professor Chelsea Watego, and I think she helps us to break some of those stereotypes that we have to be always polite and nice and sweet and perhaps we don't have to be as. Yeah. Yeah. Question I, I get asked a few times is that they go, but are you still a social worker? I get that too. Or are you still a member of the community? So yeah. as soon as we somehow get educated and get a degree and become a social worker, somehow then we're not a social worker or an Aboriginal person anymore. Um, I, I have to say when I walked into social work, I wor walked in with Aboriginal values, which really then aligned with social work values. So I became double I guess valued if that's and yeah. quite annoying because of it right I'm very very clear on my values it's, it's it's how I do everything but how can I ever not be a social worker I'm always trying to look at things with empathy and doing no harm and respect for persons it's just after 20 years being one it's just sort of what you do it's just who I have become it's sort of morphed into a me um, how I do it of course is my own way as you. So it's this weird conversation that suddenly I'm not connected to the community and suddenly I'm not connected to social work and now I'm an academic, whatever that means. Yeah. And it's a different animal. And I'm, um, perhaps that's where we're going wrong in social work is that we do leave our social work at the door. Perhaps we need to go pick it up again. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if that makes sense, because social work to me and the values that it, that it has brings everything you need to create a pretty good human. I know when people ask me, like recently, I, like I won the Social Work of the Year Award, right? And people are going, but AJ, you haven't been a social worker for a long time. I'm going, what do you mean? <laughs> I do. Is, is social work related? Because sometimes people have that huge perception that you're a social worker that works at Centrelink or the social worker that works at the hospital. I, I actually... Um... I hold social work a little bit responsible for this, actually, because I, I believe a lot of social workers come into social work wanting to fix themselves and fix communities and help and save all that colonised ideas. I don't know that there's enough diversity and conversation about all the ways social workers have been. If you look at, for example, another person I admire deeply, Tom Kalmer. Yeah. Tom Kalmer hasn't taken any um, traditional social work trajectory and yet is one of the leaders of Aboriginal social work, if I would argue. So I think they need more choices. They need to see research is an actual way to do things, policy is a way to do things. And that sometimes um, I don't think we say to people enough, actually, I don't know that you're ready for face-to-face uh, -face therapeutic work. Maybe you need to go and work outside of that for two or three years and then come back to that because it is actually pivotal we do talk about it if you don't self-care and look after yourself you can't you can't there's times when you need to do your own therapy 
I remember standing recently in front of a master's group and saying, perhaps, you know, we need to go to therapy. And they were so angry at me. How dare I suggest we go to therapy? And I said, you know, we are therapists, right? <laughs> yeah. but they, we actually say there's no shame to be a therapist. In fact, we should be doing it all the time. We should be doing all the things we're teaching as our way of being. So it's it it does it it um it does blow my mind a little bit, but I think it's a great conversation for you to role model to other people who all the paths, all the choices and all the amazing things social workers can do in all sorts of spaces, not just the therapeutic space. Yeah. And that you can be quite therapeutic. I was in a room with academics the other day giving heaps of empathy and someone turned around and said, I really needed to, someone to hear that. Thank you. I'm like, no worries. Like social worker in the room. Yeah. That's yeah. part of what I think I can give is just my ear. Yeah. I can talk a lot too. But what, are some stereotypes, <laughs> what are some stereotypes you still hear about Aboriginal people that you want to break? I, I often am not thought about at all. AJ, when we're talking about the award or the role or the position or the – and I, I am last on anybody's list to be thought about as an Aboriginal person. Um, people are often shocked when I say, I'd like to do that or I think I could do that. Um, and it's not just about me being Bindi. It's actually not thinking of anybody Aboriginal. We are not visioned as part of the organised, well, I'm talking about academia at the moment. In academia, we're often not visioned. I mean, we're visioned as, oh, you could do the PVCI, but we're not visioned as leaders in any other way, shape or form. We're just plonked into these little circles that we may not fit. So there's my first issue about stereotypes is I believe we're still othered. We're still stereotyped as having to be saved. Um, I am always fixing because I'm, on many panels and judge many things fixing language i am not i'm not i do not need to be more resilient i'm one of the most resilient people i know and i am not vulnerable all the time i have vulnerabilities and there's time when i feel vulnerable i'm also not angry all the time um the stereotype of me being angry um i'm not i have moments where i'm angry but i am um, righteously asking for social justice and there's a difference. Yeah. Um, so I still see the stere the main stereotype is that we still need saving and yeah. rescuing and helping and assisting instead of the system being seen as broken, instead of the uh, – we see the, the people still being broken. So we still hear this language of uh, how we get these students through. And, yeah, so that's the biggest stereotype I still hear that uh, grates me a little bit, I have to say. Yeah, well, I, I want to add to that because some of our the Aboriginal students that I work with too, and that's when you talk about the systemic and the little bit of racism that does exist as well, when some of the Aboriginal kids actually hear the teachers talking to uh, the non-Indigenous kids saying that when you complete Year 12, this is what you can do, but when they talk to the Aboriginal kids, it's if you get to Year 12. Mm. Mm. It's like knocked down before you even got there. Mm. I, I think too... I often think about the way we're spoken about in higher education when all I go into a room, and I have been in many of them, and all I hear are the statistics and the deficits. That's me. That's my child. That's it's. We talk about strengths-based all the time, but finding it and finding people who speak from it is actually quite rare. So it can really knock your confidence um, to hear how you're spoken about at university and when people talk about, oh, well, you'll need support. Well, hang on a second. Can you just give me a minute to get my feet? And maybe I won't need support. Maybe I will. Maybe I'm just like every every other person on the planet. But um, can you just let me have a minute? So, yeah, it's, um, it's quite um, changing the system, um, and I'm trying, and it's not easy, is um, – is something I'm very passionate about. I, I work a lot with our research office around language and and do we really need to say it like that? Do we really need to do it like that? Um, why? Yeah. Trauma-informed practice is an interesting concept because a lot of a lot of professionals I work with go, yes, 
I, I, I work with trauma-informed, trauma-informed, trauma-informed. And the thing that I often throw back at them is if, if you don't understand our history and how recent in, our, in history some of this stuff really is, where do you think this trauma is coming from? Because they always go back to colonisation and intergenerational trauma, which, yep, I think started some of the stuff. But if they don't know that even the recent history, they're not at all the or exactly identifying where the stats and facts are right now in 2023. I think a lot of people miss knowing where the trauma actually originates from, if that makes sense. I spend a lot of my time teaching people what regulation is, what emotional regulation is and what regulation is, because I don't even want to have the conversation with you if you're not regulated. Um, and so if you're not walking the walk and understanding your own limbic system, your own um, triggers, your own biases, your own um, where you are at, what you need to regulate. Again, an example was when I was, um, was colouring in with my Aboriginal colouring in book at, at a big meeting and someone came and said, I was watching you colour and I felt calm. It was the first time I felt calm in a meeting ever. I'm like, why are we not teaching regulation to our educators? If we cannot regulate ourselves, how the heck can we teach trauma-informed practice? So trauma-informed for me, it's a buzzword. It sounds really neat, but you really need to be dividing it up into where do I start? Where, where do I start on this journey for me? How do I apply trauma-informed to me before I decide I'm going to save someone else with it? Yeah. <laughs> I love that. I'm, I'm going to use that now in my training. I'm going to, I'm going to, a wise woman once told me, <laughs> and uh, I'll preface it that way. But, yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I actually think that's you, you said that perfectly then. It's kind of true though, right? Without, If we can't both be regulated in a conversation, how are we actually going to ask for transformational change or any change at all? If you're in your limbic system, I, I, you've actually got no capacity. You have not got the capacity to grow and change and move. And I actually talk about capacity as well. Are you at capacity to have this conversation right now? Because if you're not, if for example, if you were someone in the room that had no capacity, then I'm actually doing harm by insisting you have this conversation with me. So I will say to um, there's lots of different uh, things we do to regulate and to give choices, but also where's your capacity? There's days where I'm like, I am full. I call it full. My brain will not take on anymore. I've gone into sort of like a little zombie mode. This is not the time to come and ask me, so Bindi, what do you think about blah, blah, blah? Because you will not get a very good response. So it's, you know, asking people. So I have three rules. Do they have capacity? Are they regulated? And do they consent? So I give the example that if I was on a bus with Peter Dutton, for example, sorry, Peter, and yeah. uh, we were sitting together, I would not talk to Peter Dutton about anything Aboriginal because I don't think he has capacity. I'm, I'm not sure about his regulation, but I certainly don't think he would give me consent to truly talk in a way for transformational change, not just a chit-chat, an action-based transformational change conversation. So those are the three ingredients to create that. Will you create that every time in a room with 30 people? No. You're probably looking for maybe two, three, four out of that. Um, but I'll start there. <laughs> and the yeah. rest I sort of say, uh, you know, do what you need to do to regulate. Let's start there. And then if you've got capacity and consent, I'll go further. Yeah. Probably. So you've got a new book coming out soon, haven't you? Or is it already out? We have several. <laughs> so... Um, we do. We're going to have an Aboriginal research book coming out in the new year, which um, with um, Dr. Kelly Menzel, which I'm really excited about. We're going to have Our Voices third edition come out, and I'm going to be doing that with Dr. Jacob Pran. So I'm really excited about that. And then we have I have a little disasters book um, coming out, and another international Indigenous research book. So we have a couple coming out um, in 2024. Watch this space. Um, and if anyone's interested and still has time and energy and wants to be part of any of those, please contact one or both of the people I've mentioned. You don't have to talk to me. You can talk to – always make sure I have someone um, really beautiful and social and kind and wonderful in my team. So that's Jacob and Kelly. 
<laughs> so if you don't want to talk to me, you can talk to them and um, and be part of it. We're really excited to make sure that we have people in the field and that's what Aboriginal Fields of Practice was all about. Let's actually hear from the field. But, EC, you know, ECRs, HDRs, young academics, old academics, pretty much anybody, as long as you're Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander and want to write, we actually help people write and walk away from the authorship. I don't want the authorship and I don't need it, but I can help you get a publication. So I'm really interested in mentoring and assisting. Um, so we're quite proud of a lot of the work we've done, trying to make sure we we get diversity and new people every time. Someone complained that we don't, our voices one looks nothing like our voices two and it will look nothing like our voices three. A lot of people retired, but also that's the point. Yeah. The point, the point is like here's another 15 people and another 15 people. You cannot go anywhere but find us. Yeah. I think that's good because voices change as well. So over time. Can I ask you a question? When, when Voices, the first one came out, how long ago was that? Uh, whoo, I think it was 2013. That's what I was thinking too. I think it's about 10 years. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When did the second one come out? Uh, that one, I think, was twenty nineteen. Yeah. Yeah. Are you gonna have? A, are you gonna do a a, a fourth a fourth version in five years? Um, I don't know if it will be me. I may yeah. hand the baton over to someone else at that point, um, and let someone else have a run. I, um, but if if I, I like the fact that we can keep making Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander books. I went to a – where it all came from, I went to a um, uh, two places. I went to a conference in Canada and Fernwood Publishing had this whole table of Aboriginal books on Aboriginal people by Aboriginal people, Indigenous people of Canada. And I was like, what? I want to be this. This is what I want to have happen. And I came back and then a, a, someone, a Dr. Christine – King said to me, that would be a really great idea. You know, you sh we should you – know, there should be books. And I think our voices opened the door to so many more Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people going, yeah, I could do a book. Or like Dr. Lorraine Mueller, I could do two <laughs> or three, <laughs> you know, PhDs, a couple of PhDs. Amazing, you know, like, wow. So um, I just want to make opportunity and I want to open doors and and give people confidence that they too could do this. If they want to, they don't have to. But if they want to, because, again, social work teaches us, you know, um, therapy, therapy, therapy. But there's nothing wrong with doing a publication as well as your therapy. And so it's opening doors and choices and windows and people thinking, oh, okay, well, if they can do it. Honestly, I didn't know what an adjective or a noun was until I was 37. So if I can do it, anyone can do it. In that way, because honestly, I, my, as my PhD uh, supervisor said to me, nouns and adjectives really made my sentences much better. Uh, yeah. Mm, it's helpful if you've got them. <laughs> so I want to really create that. Now, do your own. Do it with me. Do it with Jacob. Do, do, just do it. Let's just – so that we have that table or two or three for generations to come. Yeah. Now we're running out a little bit of time, but I actually – want to say thank you for joining us today but what was one thing you want people to walk away with from our bit of a yarning in the last hour um two things actually the first thing is social workers can and do do anything we can go in any space work in any place and we can change that too we're great advocates and the second thing is as an aboriginal torres strait islander person you are enough just as you are even if you don't know that much about being Aboriginal yet or Torres Strait Islander yet, you are enough. And you're perfectly Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander just as you are right now. Yeah, those are the two things. So, guys, I want to say thank you to Bindi for joining us and I'll see you guys at the next podcast. Thanks. Bye. Bye.